All right, Mike Chick, good morning. Everyone see my cam? Welcome, welcome. Uh, I have three of you, Ms. Mars, uh, Ms. Laura, Ms. Zanive, we're all good to go. Okay. This is, of course, the heart. And uh, as a corollary to this, well, well, I forgot to mention, this is MED 110. I'm Dr. Garayas. This is week eight out of a week 10 program, November 30, Tuesday, 9 a.m. or 9-ish. And uh, what we're doing today is the heart. Uh, you have other members of your class who did the heart already. Um, um during week five because you know they they were here and they wanted to hang out and uh it's all right uh you guys are now here and you will also get credit as well so if you look at the heart the first thing you have to figure out is orientation what's front and what's back and if you recall um uh, uh my lecture the cardiovascular lecture you'll see that let me take the probe if you see here this is, of course, the point of the heart, the apex, and all the little tubes on the top, that's your base, okay? So that's the first part of the orientation. Know what top and bottom is. The top, of course, is the base. The bottom is, uh, or the pointy part is your apex. You also have these grooves here, if you see them, okay? That is your interventricular sulcus. So. A sulcus is a groove, it's in here. And then of course, there's gonna be a ventricle here and another ventricle here, a smaller room here, which is your uh, atria. And you could see like in real life, it's much exaggerated. It's much smaller than the textbook. You could also notice here how the color of the fat is not really yellow. In textbooks, it's yellow, but in real life, it's like milky white. And the thing about if you were in lab and you, or maybe you're, uh, you're at home and uh, maybe you're cooking with, uh, um, you know, uh, maybe soup with hearts or something like that, right? There are a lot of cultures that uh, use that, including my own. Uh, it's a muscle. So when you feel it, it's tough. And if you look at the interventricular sulcus here, how do I know I'm in the front? My atria are in the front. The interventricular sulcus is going kind of like diagonally here. And that's separating left ventricle from the right, left atrium, right atrium. So that's how you know you're in the front. And in your back, if you look at the posterior interventricular sulcus here, it's kind of like heading straight down towards the apex. And also, you'll also notice here, if you feel even, oh, it's even open right here. There's this huge venous structure here, and that's called your coronary sinus. Now, within these interventricular sulci, sulci plural, right? That's where you would find um, arteries and veins. And that's your coronary arteries and veins. Morning, morning, welcome, welcome. Uh, follow the instructions and then uh, uh, you can uh, join him uh, with a dissection and, and uh, help him out in dissection and to follow on. And I'll, and I'll be with you guys after I give um uh the people who are online um some instruction on what lab was about so when you're looking at for your exam know what's top your base bottom apex left and right by the formation of the interventricular sulci right or the grooves here okay and uh to recap the back part now I mentioned there's a big uh, venous structure back here called your coronary sinus, okay? Now, if you are feeling up top here, you will look at here, and let me clean up some of these spots. This is, of course, is your straight scissors. The way you hold your straight scissors is put your first digit in one hole, the other third digit in the other one, and your second on this part here, it's called the fulcrum, so you can have full control. Okay, because if you just like this, it's kind of, kind of hard to control. So let me just cut away some of this fat. Another thing that I could use is a scalpel. I could either hold it like this, like a pen, or I could hold it like this. Okay. 
Do, 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 do. Now, notice I'm cutting away from myself and I'm cutting in small sections so I know not to, uh, like, because if you cut in like exaggerated sections, you know, it could be too forceful, you could cut yourself. So as I'm cutting away some of this stuff, ooh, ooh, ooh. okay. You will also look at and feel the difference between an artery and the vein. And one of the, uh, one of the main differences is that artery, of course, when you feel it, it's gonna be tough. And when you look at it, let's give, let's give a, a classic example with the aorta. Oh, this really hard covering, uh, the manufacturer or the people who process this uh, took it off. But this hard covering right here is hard to even, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, this is your pericardium. This is the very outer uh, layer of your heart. And it's not only serves as a protective function, if you recall the uh, lecture, it also serves as a, um, um, you know, as a double sided bag that also kind of uh, helps lubricate the motion of the heart so that there'll be less friction. So let's open up this aorta, if I can get to it. And with the group with the, um, with the pig, um, cut the pig open in the, in the format that uh, the book has, you know, where the dotted lines is. And before you like look in and go in there, look at the skin and see if, how many layers can you identify. Then I'm kind of doing double duty today, but that's all right. Oh, right here. Up. And also for the people who are here who already took the, uh, the uh, first lab, um, you could, I'll also make this video available so it'll be a nice review. If you look at this aorta, and how do I know it's the aorta? First things first, I could, I know my left ventricle and my right ventricle. I could stick a probe in here, right? And if you, if you were here in class, it would be pointing towards the left ventricle. And when you look at it, you see how thick it is and how it forms like a, a natural circle, a natural patent, uh, like a, a tube. And, and you feel it, it's tough, just as tough as the, um, the, the heart muscle itself. And that's how you know you're looking at an artery. And this is the largest artery in your heart and that's your aorta and that's coming from your left ventricle, okay? Now, the other thing I also mentioned in my lecture is, is the left anterior descending artery. And this is your, uh, the main part is your um, anterior interventricular artery, but the left anterior descending artery is of note because this area right here on about 80% or so of all heart attacks also known as myocardial infarctions. This is where it's going to get um, blocked, hence the term infarction, which is block. So if you have no oxygen, right, what happens? This part will die because remember, a muscle needs oxygen, just like everything else in our body. So that's how you identify the great structures up here. And uh, if you were here in lab, we would have you guys cut all this and then identify all the tubing up here. So when, for those of you playing along at home, um, uh, what do you call that? Um, look at your diagram, make sure that, that you, and look at the box diagram video and, you know, make sure you can identify all the tubes. And if you look at this in real life, all the tubing is, kind of all the same color. So you got to use your, you know, other senses, you got to feel around. Now let's look at, let's look at, try to see a larger uh, venous structure if we can. Let's see if I clean this up.
Okay, that's part of the aortic arch. Trying to find either your superior or inferior vena cava. And now it's hard to find. But let's look at a model. All right, I'll be right back. Let me get a model. So if you're looking at a model, right? It's a little bit easier because everything's called red and blue. So if you know it's red, right? And then you've got to trace what it is, you kind of know it's an artery or odds are it's an artery unless it's the uh, pulmonary vein, which of course is um, uh, oxygenated. Or if it's blue, it's deoxygenated. That's how you know it's a venous structure. But even on this model, when you're looking, like if ever you're dissecting or maybe uh, you're assisting in surgery or whatever, right? If you're looking at it, you'll see that the venous structures are more flat and they're thinner than the uh, arterial structures. So know the difference between your artery and vein. That's a very, very good question on your final exam, especially for this class. Now, I already mentioned the outer layer, which is your pericardium. Okay, that's the tough layer on the outside. And you can see here, I'm really trying to pull it apart. It's not that easy. Now let's look at the inside. Okay. So I'm gonna cut this thing in half so that I can expose the anterior portion and then the posterior portion. And I'm using this wonderful surgical tool. Uh, from their 99 cent store called the knife. I just find it easier if I did it this way. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I should have some mood music while I'm doing this. Those of you who are wanting to go into surgical service, especially neurosurge when they have bench surgery, get used to the, uh, the musical preferences of your surgeon. So if you look at here, it's pretty obvious which ones, the, um, uh, which, uh, uh, which structures are arterial. You see here how thick this is? Okay, and then I'm opening this up. I could see how thick my ventricles are. There's a ventricle, there's a ventricle. But if you look at the atria, look at, here's a piece of it, it's very small. And what, what, what differentiates arteri um, the atria versus the ventricles is, the atria of course is very small, they're thin walled, but look at the ventricles, they're very thick. And this is your, see this little line of fat here? That's your epicardium. This area here, myocardium, and the inside structures of your ventricle that have these trabeculations or these branches here, that's your trabeculae carne. That's part of your endocardium, know your layers. So the tough, tough outer one that we just showed earlier, pericardium, this little, little thin layer, it's like a little fat, that's your epicardium. And in your epicardium, you're going to have um, your coronary arteries and veins here. Then your myocardium, and this is your, uh, um, your septum that separates the left and right ventricles. And then of course, the very, very deep on the inside, that's your endocardium. So know your layers. Who's on my phone? Could be student. Well, it goes, I, I went to the thing because I'm like, ah, I've been practicing medicine all this time. I know my diabetes stuff. You know what? Uh, they made me take a 20 item quiz. I failed it thinking, oh, I know everything. No, you don't, right? There's always something new. And I learned all these new things 
And um, the main takeaway, especially for those of you who are who maybe are pre-diabetic like myself or have diabetes mellitus type two, most of the interactions and management is not medical. Let me repeat myself. It's not medical. It's lifestyle changes. Get your butt to the gym. Start eating nice things. Stop drinking. Stop smoking. But aren't these 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 four things very very hard to do? especially if you did not grow up with it. Um, I'm not an alcoholic, but I love alcohol. I love drinking ever since I, I don't know, as long as I could, uh, I think of since I was a teenager. It took me years to quit to, because I'm constantly, you know, you're at parties or whatever, you know, you have a drink in your hand. But then I'm like realizing this is not good for me. And this is part of what we do. You All you future nurses, future clinicians, we're, we're, we're the one, we're, we're the stick in the mud. We're the ones who have to tell our patient the, the not so great news. Like, Hey, no more salt. Hey, uh, you gotta, you know, go take a walk every once in a while. And we have a very sedentary lifestyle. We as healthcare professionals, uh, I've been on my butt all morning. Right. And when you go service your patient, you walk from this room to that room, look around you. It's not that far. And if you count how many steps, it's not that many. Well, even if you're working in the ward and where, when do you eat? I eat breakfast at what? Four o'clock in the morning. You know what I had? Uh, a Coke and some Cheetos. That's bad. I can't, I, well, I'm exaggerating, but I can't, I can't do that anymore. But I can tell you when I was working, do that all day. There's a reason why 47% of all nurses are at least class one obese. And it's not because uh, nursing attracts uh, uh, um, obese people, it's because our lifestyle. Those of us who already work in the field, it's stressful. We don't get time to eat. You don't get time to sleep. And, and all of this is just a bad, is a bad mix all around. So trainings are important, but <laughs> lucky me, I don't have to be at this one. There'll be one less training. And it's not medical too. So, so um, oh, those of you who are on the, uh, the pig, right? Once you now, well, I'll go over uh, uh, about the skin. Once you like looked at the skin, open up one of the arms or legs. Now look at the muscle, tendons, and all those other things. And then uh, I'll go through that. Well, and of course, I'll include everyone at home as well. So you know the layers. You have your epicardium, of course, the tough layer, pericardium on top of that. Then you have your myocardium, which is the most. So when you get a heart attack, when this stuff starts to die, this myocardium, that's the muscle part. That's the part that pumps. That's the part that contracts. And if that doesn't contract very well, then the blood won't go out. Blood doesn't go out. Then you're going to have a blood pressure problem and a whole bunch of other problems. And then oxygen doesn't get to go where it goes. <laughs> I just noticed all my rant was on, uh, was recorded, but that's okay. Um, now, the endocardium, let's look at these structures here. Let me see if I can get even closer. If you look at the endocardium, you have your atria that's up here and your ventricle that's down here. So you have sets of valves. You have one set on here, this is on the right side. And if I close this set over, there's another set here. And this would be the left one. See how it opens up like a book. So this is right, this is left. This, this is right. This is left because it opens up like a book. But if you see here, just like a parachute, and that's your AV valve, your atrioventricular valve. That's the valve in between your ventricle and your atria, which has got chopped up, which is up here somewhere. So the one on the left is called your bicuspid or mitral valve, and the one on the right is called your tricuspid. So here, the bicuspid one here, right? Um, they got severed, but you could see here, there's little cords, a rope, and that's your chordae tendine, and it connects into this. Tendons connect into muscle, and this, these little finger-like projections that are sticking out of your trabeculae carnae in your um, uh, endo, endo, not metrium, endocardium of your heart, that is your papillary muscle. So it goes papillary muscle, chordae tendine, and then the leaflet of whatever it is. So this one, this one's on the right side. So this gotta be the tricuspid. This one here, if I fold it over like this, it'll be on the left side. This is your bicuspid. You really can't tell which one has two leaflets versus three leaflets, uh, but um, 
uh, on your on your exam, uh, I will be picking one. And uh, if we look at the lecture, I'll be picking the one that the one that has three papillary muscles and it's on the right side, that's got to be your tricuspid. And the one that has two papillary muscles connected on the left side, then that's got to be your bicuspid. Bi means two. That means it also has two names. It has uh, the other name is your mitral valve. Doesn't that sound and look like a beautiful both A and B question? So with that being said, those are your internal structures, you know, kind of basically your external structures. And that's pretty much um, uh, the heart and what's more important about the heart. And uh, we took way more time um, dissecting this, uh, removing the uh, removing all the fat and really looking into it. But those of you viewers at home, I just wanted to uh, you guys to get an overview so that, uh, you know, at least be uh, you know, uh, at least a video participant um, on the uh, cardiac lab. So it's at this portion where I'm going to now uh, move the camera to uh, the group that's here, right? And those of you who are that's here, make sure to sign in. And whoever is on IMS Galaxy Note 9 uh, notepad, uh, make sure to um, uh, message me so I know your, uh, know your full name so I can uh, add it onto um, you know, uh, the attendance list uh, for today. So everybody who, who's working at home, I know and understand, uh, you guys emailed me the reasons why you can't come in, uh, fully aware of it, and that's why we're doing it on video as well. So at least you can have some participation. All right, so let's switch gears. And now we're going over to Ms. Piggy, our friend and yours. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Let's see. I should get a I should mask up would be nice. So let's look at the pig. Is there a way that I can just see me? Because this is tiny. There you go. Okay. That's Piggy. And the way um, the group here had it all splayed out, uh, you might even uh, hear the term vivisection in pathology. This is how we cut open people in the same manner. There's a line that goes down here, line comes out here, and it opens up like a book. Okay. So the first thing that uh, we looked at the group. So with the group that's here, what did you notice about the skin? Got muscles. Okay, yeah, of course, got muscles attached to it, good, right? But what's the difference between the top layer and the inside layers? What, do you, what is the first thing you noticed? I mean, top layer is like more harder than inside. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, here with the heart, this one had the pericardium attached to it. Mm -hmm. See this? Mm -hmm. Here and remember uh, the last time we had the dissection. Look, see, I'm really trying. I can't rip it. Same thing with the outer skin. It's really hard to rip the outer layers. So we already now know that things that are tougher in the human body and in anatomy are on the outside. And it makes sense because the outside world is a harsh place. Mm -hmm. So I need protection. So the skin is a living, breathing thing. And the top layer, just like bone, it slops off. So it's like having a shield. Then when the shield goes bad, we throw it out and we have a new one right on top of it, mm -hmm. right? And you see its toughness. Now, if you were here, what do you guys notice about the inside? Did you guys notice how, well, this, one, this little guy is a little bit dehydrated, but yeah. what, what, here, feel this. What does this feel like? It's like more moist. And it's moist. It's like yeah. uh, it's it's like a lubricant. Mm -hmm. So that's your mucosal lining, that's on the inside. And if we start looking at some of the tissue here, here's some of your fascia. See how it's shiny? And look, the outside I can't rip. But look, with just my finger, I don't even need a scalpel or straight scissors or anything. Look what I can do. I can start ripping everything, and opening. See, see how I separated all this. I didn't even use a knife, see? 
again, and look on the inside. See how that's shiny? Maybe the camera can catch that. See how it's shiny? That's not only mucosa, and you guys feel it. The inside is fascia. Every organ, every muscle has another covering, internal covering on top of the skin that we already have. So whoever built us, built us pretty perfect. So if there's any trouble that the skin is going over, and feel this part, like it, I know this piggy is a, a fetal pig, so it didn't grow up to eat enough Doritos, but guys, feel this part versus it's like other parts. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's cushiony, isn't it? And now you now know what fat feels like. And even if we looked at the heart, you guys see, see how fat feels very different than muscle. Those of us who are here physically, all right, can assure you this is muscle and it's hard. And then if I look here, if I start pressing on our, our feeling muscle and bone, it's hard. But if I start feeling on fat, there's a give. It's soft. So when you look, remember we talked about in week two, form equals function, right? So if something looks and feels a certain way, it's going to act a certain way. So we already now know the skin, it's tough. So of course it's a barrier, okay? And the fat, it's kind of paddy and soft. So that'll be what? The cushion. And you can't have no fat, you have to have some, right? And it'll be a cushion. It's also a good insulator. It is also the reason why all your nerves are wrapped in fat. Your brain is fat. Essentially, you, uh, if um, and I'm in physiology too, you'll be cutting up a brain and it'll feel totally different than this. And it'll be lighter and it'll be sponge-like. And then this, you saw when I was cutting this open with the Ginsu knife, I was like, eh, you know, oh, the brain, you don't even need a sharp scalpel, right? You could take a spatula and go, and it'll just cut like butter because it's what? It's fat. So we have skin, we have fat, we have fascia. Now, the next thing that the group was doing uh, uh, was we were looking at uh, the tendons and um, the other ligaments here. And you could tell how they are because they're not only shiny, they're also just like the skin, they're hard to break. So did you guys identify uh, fascia or this covering that connects bone to muscle, right? You could look at it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's your ribs. Okay, let's look at some. Let's, you know what? Let me dissect this a little bit better. Let's open it now to the, to the knuckle. Okay, so if you see here, you see these bands? Might not be able to see it at home, but there are bands here, and this is like the, the piggy's like elbow, and there's a band, you see that there's like white, and it's connecting from this muscle here to the bone. Feel it, it's tough, and that's a tendon. So tendons connect muscles to bone. So let's say, for example, I'm a professional athlete, right? I was playing football and my tendon did what? Got tendonitis. I have some, uh, and that's called a strain, S-T-R-A-I-N, right? The, the management for a strain versus a sprain is the same thing, you know, elevation, put ice on it and, and immobilize the joint and so on and so forth. But a strain is actually that thing here got overstretched or torn or pulled. And it's connected right to a muscle. So if that's torn, and of course there's arteries, veins, and nerves running throughout there, can Piggy move the arm? No, just like a human being. So if there's a problem, my patient can't move that arm or can't do that particular movement, right? I have to investigate it. Is it the brain that's a problem that connects to a nerve? Is the nerve a problem? Or is the muscle a problem? Or is the tendon that connects to the bone a problem? Or is it the bone that is a problem? And now you could see relatively how you could take something as simple as, doc, my elbow hurts, I can't move it. Or when I move it, I got um, lateral epicondylitis left here. When I move it like a certain way like this, it hurts, right? So they had to investigate, right? And did you see how they did it? They did it in an organized fashion. 
And isn't that how your anatomy and physiology is? I know that that tendon is connected to what? A muscle. So I have to inspect the tendon. I have to inspect the muscle. I have to inspect the bone that's connected to that tendon. See how one thing leads to another, leads to another. And that's why the, the, the process of uh, being a clinician and to get the diagnostics, to get the, you know, what is wrong, which is the answer of, man, uh, the answer of assessment and diagnosis, right? What's wrong? Remember the medical term diagnosis? It is the state or condition of dia, complete or thorough, no or knowledge. And if you have the basic, basic anatomy and physiology, figuring out what hurts, why, and then fixing it, it doesn't become complicated. Actually, it becomes a very, very neat process. So understanding its form, what does it look like, which is anatomy, then you'll understand how it's all related together, physiology. So remember, muscle to bone, tendon. Now, we can't really see it in here, but if I open this up, and you guys know, because if you like um, look at, um, next time you guys have Popeyes or chicken, open it up. You know, the crispy outside, that's the outer tough skin, right? Yeah. Then you have another skin underneath that. That's your fascia. You'll see the skin that's underneath it is really shiny. It's not only shiny because of the oil that you, uh, uh, that you, you fried it in. It's shiny because what? There's a mucosal lining in it. And what does the mucosa do? And look at it. Since it's all sticky like that and very lubricated, not only lubricate, don't you think any dust or anything that will get in there will, will get it? And that will, that's more for um, the lining that's inside your lung tissue because there's a reason why whoever made us made the tougher outer layer tough because there's, and I'm not exaggerating. I, I used to say this when I used to teach microbiology. There's 250 potential pathogens in this room right now that can easily kill you. But why doesn't it, right? Like, why is it that we don't have COVID and others do? And that, and remember your initial chapters, the one we talked about stress, when we talked about your frontline defenses. So if you're dehydrated and don't have this mucosal lining, what happens, right? You don't, you, if you don't mask up, you are not protecting yourself to the 249 things that'll kill you. So the 249 things will do what to your immune system? It'll bottom it out. And then what does COVID get to do? It gets to come in, or it's already there, yeah. right? Uh, I, uh, my daughter keeps on having uh, COVID, COVID uh, antibodies, and she was like, "I've been negative forever. Now all of a sudden I'm positive." And uh, she, she was, uh, she was a nurse. She was working, uh, she was working in a, a very high risk ward for, or for almost a year and a half. And she was like, "It's been a year since I worked. Why am I getting hit now?" Again, lower the immune system. And the thing that was always hanging out, it's, and it's called an opportunistic infection. Okay. So that's your musculature. And, uh, and what we're, um, I forgot to always also explain this. What we're also doing here is we're kind of integrating everything. We're going to, we're, we're looking at, we're looking at the organism now as a whole, mm -hmm. as a confluence of all these other systems put together. So here, right off the bat, we're talking about immune system. We're talking about musculoskeletal. Right, and uh, the, 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 uh, and also another thing, we're gonna move on to the next section. But another thing you could do at home, like you know, uh, maybe you've made some soup, right, and you've got some beef bones or some chicken bones, cut them open, break it open, and you'll see that the bone is a hollow thing, and it has things in it. Yeah. And uh, any of you who like oxtail soup or sopa de res, or in uh, my culture, in the Filipino culture, we call it bulalo. What do you do? It's beef vert vertebrae, and you put it in what? A broth. And all the fat from the bones leaches out into the soup. And all the salt from the blood, the red marrow, right? Because blood has what? A lot of salt in it. It all leaches out. That's what makes the soup taste phenomenal, right? All that fat, all that goodness all that saltiness, right? Um, and everywhere I've been uh, from oxtail soup to uh, sopa de res in, in, in many uh, Latin American countries, it's all, it goes, if you know and understand your anatomy and physiology, then you know, oh, that's why this soup is phenomenal. And by the way, when you guys go to restaurants, you know the why things taste really great? Because it's fat and a lot of salt. 
go home, re-eat that food. It's not tasty anymore, is it? When you get it from the restaurant and maybe you had some leftovers and you eat it, you eat it cold at home. Number one, you'll see all the fat. Number two, it's really salty or it's too sugary because uh, goes, oh, what did they do to you? That's why a lot of people like the restaurants because they, everyone on the fifth floor, the culinary people know that what do people like? Sugar, fat, salt, right? And of course, their presentation as well. So the group here, since you started cutting, your turn. I want you to open this up, uh, just like the Joker, cut open this so we can look at piggy's tongue and uh, oropharynx. So cut down here. Okay. So right now we're opening up the oral cavity. Let's look at, uh, let's look at the, uh, the hard and soft palate and why do we have a hard and soft palate? Let's also look at why do we have a tongue? There's multiple reasons. There's two reasons actually. And it makes sense because your hypoglossal nerve is both sensory and um, uh, motor, which means that the tongue has to do something motor, right? It has to do something mechanical. And of course, tongue, we all know, we just talked about food. Now I'm hungry, right? Um, so it's also sensory. Cut all the way down? Well, enough to that we can open it. Yeah. Like about a little bit more, a little bit deeper, because what I'm going to ask you to do now is once you have that, let's do this. And you got to be wary of uh, piggy's teeth. Just yeah. break it open. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's look at so. the tongue and feel the heart. Doesn't it feel the same thing? And there are many cultures that we have uh, soups and stews that have tongue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I only can eat tongue if my mom cooks it. Uh, my wife cooks it. Tastes weird. Uh, oh, gee, am I recorded? Uh, oh, yeah, let's hope she doesn't look at my lecture. Don't say that. Don't say that out loud. Uh, but there's some, but if you look at the tongue, first of all, the feeling of it, right? We know that it's what? It's hard. So it's a muscle. muscle. And that's why it tastes good. Uh, uh, oh, my God, goodness. Uh, when I used to live in New York, I used to go to this marvelous Jewish deli that had tongue on rye. I usually don't eat it. But oh my God, it was delicious, especially that the special mustard. I better stop talking about food because I haven't eaten since like five. So I'm like a little bit on the hungry side. Well, if you look at the tongue, let's look, I'm, maybe the camera might not capture it too well, but do you guys see how even when you feel it and when you look at it, there's different sections. Like there's a section here. There's another section here. It seems like just the appearance of it, there's different sections, right? Well, if there's different sections and there's different, remember, I just mentioned form equals function. So if something looks different, it's going to have a different function. So the tip of your tongue has different sensory. As you can see here, it's different looking than the rest of it. So that's where you have the sweet and salty parts. The ones on the side look a little bit weird too, different. That has the sour sensory. And the ones right here, these bag, these great things back here, that has the bitter. And in the middle is what the Japanese called umami, U-M-A-M-I. That's the tasty, that's the tastiness. Now we've identified what umami really is in the last 20 years. Umami, remember I just told I just mentioned the people, the culinary people on the fifth floor know this and know this uh, the best is that what, what drives people to the restaurant? Fat, right? <laughs> and uh, maybe I mentioned it, or I definitely mentioned it in my lecture uh, in Anatomy and Physiology too, when we did special senses, that the thing that, um, I am an addict for Doritos, okay? So if ever uh, you go to uh, anyone, if you ever see me as a teacher ever again in another institution, most. You know, most likely I'll still be teaching somewhere, right? Uh, you want to bribe me? Don't give me money. Give me a big pack of Doritos, and then I'll think about it. Just kidding, <laughs> right? But my wife, about five years ago, tried, she just bought all the bake, you know, the bake Doritos. You, you know, the snacks that are supposed to be a little bit healthier, has little, it has less salt, and it's been baked, so it hasn't been fried, so it doesn't, does have no fat. I took one bite and said, oh, my God, this is disgusting. I, this, I can't eat this. My wife says, oh, I bought three bags. It, it, just try it. You'll get, you'll get used to it. No, I can't. 
because the umami, what the umami actually is, is what they call a lipostat. Lipo meaning fat, stat means stasis or, you know, uh, homeostasis, which, uh, which means what? A certain level, right, of balance. We love restaurants, right, better than our own home-cooked meal because why? The home-cooked meal is most likely healthy. The one at the restaurant has what? A lot of cream, a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of fat, a lot of butter. You guys ever have French food? When I look at the ingredients, I'm like, I don't understand why people eat this. But then when I see how much cream and how much butter it has in it, I'm like, oh, that's why I'm eating it. Or really good pastry because it has shortening in it. What do you think shortening is? It's room temperature fat, but it tastes phenomenal. And that's what umami is. It's a lipostat. It detects fat. And you know how people have a sweet tooth? Lipostat is a fat tooth, you know, like, mm. that's why my umami doesn't like baked Doritos. I like the real Doritos, the salty, the fried one. Oh, by the way, if any of you guys go camping, uh, you don't need to bring a uh, lighter fluid, bring a bag of Doritos, take a Dorito and light it on fire. It'll burn. Mm. It'll burn. It, it will light everything on fire because why? It's got a ton of fat in it. It's got a ton of like a, uh, of umami. That's why, oh, I would love to have some Doritos right now. It would make my morning. But again, don't want to get in that hypertension. So that's the sensory part of the tongue. We all know that because that's what makes it taste. Okay. And remember, your sensory, uh, this is a little precursor to your anatomy and physiology two lectures. And I, I, don't, I, I think I'm the only one who gets really blown away by this. Everything you're sensing, everybody at home as well, and everyone here, everything you're sensing isn't real. All of this is a machination of what your brain is interpreting of what's going on. So you're looking at me, right? All right, I'm actually look like Brad Pitt. I'm actually gorgeous. But your eyes are looking at what? A five foot, like a, a five foot stocky man. I don't know why but that is your brain's interpretation of what I am. It's the same thing with your voice, right? You know, when you're in the shower, like, wah, 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 like, oh man, I should get a record deal. And then when I get out, my whole family is like, why were you singing so loud and so ugly? It was awful and the children are all crying, <laughs> right? And then I'm like, no, but it was great. You should record it. And then do you ever guys listen to your voice recording? When I listen to my recordings, I'm like, that can't be me. I'm like, oh, that voice is so grating and ugly. Ugh. But it's what? What I'm coming out of my head right now is what I believe my voice sounds like. So it's the same thing with taste. Okay. Uh, uh, half of my children were raised in the Philippines and the other half were raised here in the United States. My two older children, they can eat anything. They eat eel. Anyone like eel? I can't. I just can't. I can do fish, but eel, come on, it's like a snake. I've had, I actually had snake before in Texas. I'd rather eat snake and it was not pleasant. But again, it's what? It, it, this is a sensory, it only senses chemicals. Now, if you feel here, feel this and be careful for the teeth. There's not that many teeth, but feel this. It's rough, it's rigid. You guys ever remember the old school, you know, when we used to wash uh, clothes by hand, you know, it's got like it's metal and like this, right? Uh, uh, in, in the provinces in my country, we still have that because there's no, there's no electricity, there's no uh, washing machine. So you have to take it and you see here, when you eat, now this is the mechanical portion of the, uh, of the, the tongue. When you eat, the tongue smashes all the food up here into the hard palate. Now everyone feel, put your finger down here deep. You can see it became soft. So after your tongue smashes all the food here, and we all know that it smashes all the food up here on the hard palate into your soft palate, because you guys, uh, have you guys ever eaten a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Where does it all go? Up here in the hard palate. You will also see, well, you can't really see here. We'd have to open up here. Your nose or the uh, olfactory, right? It's connected to this. That's why 
if you hold your nose and drink something, you won't taste it. Or if you have a bad cold, you won't taste it. And now we know we, know we have an oropharynx, a soft, which is in the middle. Okay. Okay, since you're still up, right? I want you to open up this entire section here, like open it all up and try to find me the trachea, your pharynx, which is, uh, I mean, your larynx, which is your voice box. This is cartilage, right? So it's right here. So you could feel here, this cartilage. Now feel the bone, it's hard. The cartilage is hard, but not as hard. So feel the bone here and feel the cartilage. So that's how I know that is this, this a, is the- is, is this a trachea or does it- No, right here, mm -hmm. this bump right here, mm -hmm. that's the cartilage and that's your uh, laryngeal cartilage. So that's your larynx. And right here, right? And I'm gonna show you a technique called upcutting. If I go like this and cut, it's gonna mess up a whole bunch of things that I can't see. But let's say, for example, I just want to remove this fascia. I go like this, I lift it up, and I do what? Then I cut. Look what I can do with my finger. Because remember, the fascia is a lot, is a lot less tougher than this. Look, just with my finger. I can remove all that. And this is exactly how surgeons do it. Okay? So... Since you're still up, I want you to remove from here to here, up cut and remove all of this out and then we can all inspect it. And then we can look at the upper respiratory tract to the lower respiratory tract and why is it so important for that? How's my battery life? Okay, that's good. Oh, look at the... This is what he says. Set this on mm -hmm. the head. Okay. Hey, did you pull it up? Yeah. Cut it out. Let's see. It's up. I should just put the box over. This is a truck. I'm gonna have to wait. Yeah, that's, I believe. Look at it. Okay. Yep. Let's cut it out. I'll take it out. Yeah. Oh, cut it out. Okay. Now, the other thing I also want to show you guys, and you probably won't see it at home. We already know arteries and veins, and we already see how small arteries and veins can get. Well, I want to show you what a nerve looks like. There's a whole bunch of them. Oh, here. Here, we definitely know this is a vein. See how flat it is? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find it. Oh, there. See this? You see how it's kind of like translucent? Not really see-through. That's a nerve. Okay? Now, wherever an artery goes, a vein goes, and also a nerve. And, of course, lymphatic tissue. Now, if we look at this, Ooh, I almost put that on top of my phone. Not good. Let's look at the nice little hole that was created. Okay. You can see the holes here. Okay. Here's part of the uh, flap, but you could see a big wide hole. And then the hole on the bottom is like collapsible or the hole that's posterior is more collapsible. So if we're looking at this thing, the first thing that we see, and she cut a little, little low, should have told you to cut a little higher. You see this, this is like a little flap that will cover this. Mm -hmm. That's your epiglottis. So you have one hole or one tube, that's your trachea. Mm -hmm. That's gonna, that's your windpipe. That's gonna go to your lungs. Then you have the hole down here that's your esophagus, your food tube. So your trachea is anterior. The esophagus is posterior. And then when I am drinking or eating, this little flap is going to close this area right here. And that makes sense, mm -hmm. right? Whoever, told, whoever raised you said what? Don't talk while you eat. Don't, he goes, don't drink 
and talk at the same time because what happens if you do <laughs> you start choking because you'll you'll initiate a gag reflex because now what's a reflex a reflex is something that your body does to protect yourself without getting your brain involved right so it wants to close that off and that is that right here now when you're under anesthesia can you will your how quick is your body to do stuff it isn't so if you have food and then you vomit don't you think the food now can get into my trachea? If that food or any of that fluid from my stomach gets into my trachea and into my lungs, we're gonna have a really big problem. So again, to highlight every rule in the hospital, every rule that they're gonna make you memorize, it's done for a reason. That's why our job is very precise. If we skip a step, it becomes a really big problem, okay? and now that you know and understand how this works that the epiglottis is supposed to protect me what happens when i have anesthesia and means no or not anesthesi feeling so all the processes start getting what messed up right so we have to invent protocols to make sure that nothing happens now if you look at this Can you see here that the front part, you guys see here, and you can even feel it, that the front part has cartilaginous rings? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And then the back so part, that's the trachea, right? so that's gotta be the trachea. Yeah. And it's only like this. So it's only cartilage on the front part. Mm -hmm. Now that makes sense because you could see here in the back part, There's it has to be able to expand. Part. So when you're drinking or eating, that pipe will expand and then it will eat up a lot of your tracheal space. So you shouldn't be eating and talking or drinking and talking at the same time because it will confuse the epiglottis and then you're gonna have a whole bunch of problems. So anterior C-shaped cartilaginous rings, that is your trachea. Posterior, it's a flat tube, muscular tube, and it is uh, expandable. And you can see here, we can even look here. It's stretchy. You see how stretchy this is? Look, I can push the, I can, I can make Piggy eat something like three times bigger than her mouth, look. Because why? Right, because, because I shouldn't be breathing at the time. Now, we can also look at this as well. Look at the laryngeal folds. Because how do you talk? How do you? If you're here, here on the sides, feel mm -hmm. this. They're like strings on a guitar. Yeah. Right? So was, and what happens when you, you make the, the string shorter? It goes much higher. And then what happens if I let the string loose? Right? And then use the thicker parts of the cord, and the, then my voice will be lower. But you can see it requires air from your lungs. So whoever put it there, brilliant. Now, from that point down, that's lower respiratory tract. That's where we're gonna have problems, right? From this point up, upper respiratory tract problems, it's, it can be dealt with, we're, uh, you know, uh, probably send you home. But lower respiratory tract infection problems, especially in an immunocompromised patient, especially in light of COVID nowadays, uh, we like to, me personally, I like to admit. So, sir, you're next. That brings us down into our thoracic cage. And we already mentioned um, uh, the ribs. Everyone feel the ribs. See how bendy it is? It's not like it's not like the leg. Let's look at the leg. Can I bend my leg? No. Well, maybe a little because it is a piggy. But here, like the femur, I can't. It'll snap. But here, what I can do all day. Because the front part is cartilaginous. And that makes sense because for all the people at home, put your hand on your chest and take a deep breath. <sighs> what happens to your chest? It goes up and it goes out and up. And then feel your tummy. Your diaphragm bottoms down. And where's your diaphragm here? Mm -hmm. You have this nice thick muscle that's right here that separates your thoracic cavity why am I using my big fat fingers? Your thoracic cavity 
from your abdominal cavity. So, and the two things that I just mentioned, your intercostal muscles and your diaphragm are your two main muscles of inspiration, okay? If you use other muscles, that means you have dyspnea or abnormal breathing, you got a problem. And maybe, maybe some of you who have a family members or maybe yourself have asthma or bronchitis, what happens when you guys uh, have a hard time breathing? You hunt, start hunching over, right? Well, let, let, me, let me show the, the viewers at home. Like if you look at my normal breathing, right? My chest will go up, up and out. And my diaphragm will bottom out. But if you look at your patient, especially if they have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or something, you can even see how they are. You guys ever have this when you have a cough? They're hunched over like this. They try to get air in their lungs. And then you see their shoulders. You're going to start using their accessory muscles. And that's never a good thing. Right? Even though you might have a patient that's not complaining like, oh, my breathing's okay. You start seeing accessory muscles. Start noting that uh, the patient is experiencing dyspnea. And also, when you start doing the respiratory rate as well, it's going to be abnormal or uh, semi-abnormal as well. All right, sir, your turn. I would like for you to right now take out uh, the lungs and heart as a whole and then put it right here. Yes. Where can we find the, the liver? Is it, oh, I mean, the liver we're going to go uh, next. The, and it's the, huge. The kidney. Oh, kidneys? It's here. That's after we're going to oh, do the abdominal. The kidneys um, are behind oh, okay, okay. and in your abdominal cavity. And we'll show you why that's important. So kindly move the heart and lungs so we can see what's going on. So this is the same way humans are. Yep. Same. That's why we like uh, pigs Pig, and so cats okay. because of the setup. It's it's cheap and it's easy to, to train because having a human being is expensive. Uh, that's why in medical school, even in a good medical school, uh, uh, what was the ca caliber to student ratio in my school was 12 to 1. So there's 12 people on one body. It's, uh, you get to know those 11 people really well. And then you have to go visit other teams mm -hmm. because your exam can be any one of any of, and, and my class had 27 cadavers. So you had to know all 27 because you could be tested on any of them at any time. And no lie. One time it was like 11.30, the lab was supposed to close at midnight. For whatever reason, Dr. Garcia came in, God rest her soul. She was, whoo, angriest Puerto Rican I've ever met in my entire life. She came in, she goes like, exam, everybody to the hallway. There was like a hundred of us. We're all lined up in the hallway and she tested us at 11.30 at night just to see if we were awake. Ah, I'm gonna uh, miss that old bat. She was mean. <laughs> she was really mean. She once, she once hit me on the head with a clipboard. I should have, I wish I could have uh, had the right to sue her or something like that. No, she's the one who taught me all the stuff that I'm telling you now about form and function. And she was a world-class surgeon and world-class pathologist, right? Because, and I'm telling you, if you know normal, abnormal is simply what? The exact opposite of it. So if you know what normal looks like, now feel the lungs and feel the heart. Do you feel the difference in consistency? The lungs feel what? Yeah, it's more soft. Right? It's soft, it's spongy. Mm -hmm. Then the heart feels what's hard, like a muscle. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. Now we already identified the apex and the great vessels up top. You could also see how, and that's the greatest problem with you know just learning from a textbook is real life and textbook are two entirely different things. There's something called genetic variation. If I opened up your heart, your heart and my heart, there would be three entirely different things mm -hmm. on the table. And we'd all be like, what the heck is that, right? Uh, that's why you have to know and understand that there's gonna be a little bit of variation. But I know this is the front because yeah. when we took it out, that's the front. But isn't my interventricular sulcus going diagonally off my apex? Mm -hmm. Isn't my atria in the front, right? Oh, look, I have a covering. Right here, that's kind of tough. That's got to be my pericardium. Okay, and that this has got to be my right ventricle, left ventricle, and then this little flap here. That's got to be my uh, right atrium. This little flap here, left atrium, and right off the top, I can look at even though it's small. Oh, 
Look at this. See this one here? It's big. It's thick. It made a circle. Right? Oh, no, it's not thick. It's what? Kind of thin. So that's got to be what? A vein. Let's see if I can find the aorta. Now, you saw that one is big and it's flat, but this one, it's thick. Do we all see it's round? So I know that that thick and round thing's gotta be an artery. And if it's big and it looks like it's coming from the left side of my heart, that's gotta be the aorta. The other thing that, I, that was uh, big and flat, it was on the right side of the heart coming from the top, going down into my right atrium. So that's gotta be the what? superior vena cava and if i look down here it'll be a little bit harder if i find the same tube that's coming from the downstairs or from below going up into my right atrium then i then i definitely know it's my what that's my inferior vena cava right so if we look at our diagram i know right versus left i got a big flat tube coming from the top that's got to be what superior vena cava. I got a big flat tube coming from the bottom going into my right atrium. That's got to be my inferior vena cava. It looks like a shell. Yeah. And it's very interesting because the picture in your book, this, this model and this thing and this heart, they look like five entirely different things. But if you know and understand the orientation and relation to it, then it makes sense. So now that's the heart. If you also notice that the lungs have lobes and the left one only has two, one, two, and the right one has one, two, three. And we know that the heart rests on the left side, more on the left side. So there's a cardiac notch on the left side and only an upper lobe and a lower lobe on the left side. And the right side of the lung is upper, middle, and lower. So if someone gives you a report, oh, my patient has a carcinoma, small old cell carcinoma, middle, middle lobe. Do you have to ask what, what side it's on? No, because if it's middle, it's gotta be what? Right side, because right has three lobes. Left has two lobes. And this is how I remember it, not only visually, the heart's on the left side. So there's three things on the right side of my chest and three things on the left side of my chest. The three things on the left side are my upper lobe, lower lobe, and the heart. The three things on the right side of my thoracic cage is upper, middle, and lower lobe. And doesn't that scream balance? Doesn't that scream, right? Whatever's on the left has got to be on the right. So once you got that, all our viewers at home can see that as well, right? When you do it, it goes, when you got cancer, let's say we got cancer here, upper lobe up here on the right side. Whoever built this, built this really smart. It's just like a boat the cancer will tend to stay up there and won't spread to the other parts. So what can I do in real world? I can do a lobectomy. I have a cancer up there, what do I do? Remove it, take it out. Sew it up, my patients can still, can still get to live, right? I can even take out whole, a whole side and my patient still will live. So when you look at that, right? Good job. Just move the pin so I can move piggy around and also. Now, you can feel also back here, that's of course the vertebrae, all right? And of course, I know this is, has to be the cervical vertebrae because that's part of piggy's neck. And this has to be the thoracic vertebrae because I don't even have to cut open into it. I know there's gotta be a connection to the 12 ribs. Right? So we feel back here, it's more bony. You feel up here, it's more what? Cartilage. So kindly feel back here and then feel this and tell me there's a difference. Try to bend the, the, the ribs in the back. See how easily that happens. No, back is like the more. Rigid. Yeah, the back is what? Protective. More rigid, yeah. And remember the stories I told you about how many times I've had patients with multiple gunshot wounds to the chest and the back, they get to live. Not like the movies. The movies like one shot, uh, guy goes down or gal goes down. No, in real life, whoever, because whoever built us knows, knows that 
my, my lungs and my heart are very important to my survival. So I built it so that I will protect it. And there's a lot of musculature, there's a lot of things going on. And of course, this. And you could see also, there's also a covering. And if you guys look real close, can you see the arteries and veins? And this covering right here is called your omentum, mm -hmm. which is also part and parcel of your pericardium, which covered before when you opened this, it covered this entire thing. Wasn't there like a, like, it looks like a wet nightgown to me, mm -hmm. you know, when you have like a, a thin lace-like material. But when you look at it, take a real good look at it. There's a whole bunch of arteries and veins in there. So if my patient gets peritonitis, how much danger are they in? It's there's, really, a whole, there's a whole system. Yes, sir. It's really answer. dangerous because it's going to go to the whole body. Yeah, it can go. It'll, gonna... So whoever built us built us smart. I have a protection here. But that peritoneum, if that gets infected, it's not only going to infect this, this, this. It's going to infect this whole entire area. And that bloodstream is also what? Connected to what? Everything else. So when you get appendicitis, inflammation or infection of your appendix, and we're going to try to show you uh, where the appendix is. Uh, uh, on this piggy. It's not the appendicitis that I'm worried about. I'm worried about the sequelae. What will happen next? Because if that appendix bursts, where will all the feces go? It'll go over here. That will infect what? All that perit uh, peritoneum. You'll get peritonitis and that is going to be a problem. And then you get something called surgical abdomen. Uh, Although you're going to get edema fluid because it's inflammation infection, right? What's going to happen? Everyone knows that when you feel your tummy, right? Unless, you know, you got 2% body fat, it's pretty soft, right? But what happens if this is, has all edema fluid, right? And infection, it's going to get as hard as this table. So if you're inspecting your patient and you're like, uh oh, why is their stomach like rock hard? <laughs> That's no bueno. That's what? That could be a surgical abdomen and think of this little story I told you regarding peritonitis. So you get peritonitis like, uh, um, and that's what we're really afraid of. Not the, not the appendicitis, same thing with the myocardial infarction. Am I really afraid of one little clot that's right here? No, I'm afraid of when this left ventricle starts shutting down, when there's no more blood going to my systemic circulation. That's when I get upset. That's when I start getting excited. That's why when I see a heart attack patient or a pending heart attack patient, I am not thinking it's, I'm not thinking about what's gonna happen now. I'm thinking about what's gonna happen in the near future. And my job is to do what? Stop it. Because when, when your patient gets sick, we can't do anything about it, they get sick. But what can we do? That's why we don't heal anybody. We don't cure anybody. I hate those two words. And many of my colleagues also don't like those two words. We manage them medically and scientifically. And that's why that's also the other hard part because we're human beings, aren't we? It's hard. It's hard watching a fellow human being suffer. And if you can watch somebody suffer, you're in the wrong business, right? But if you can manage your emotion and know and understand how this works, it's good. Now you asked about, uh, uh, well, you first asked about your, um, kidneys. your kidneys, but then uh, I started uh, talking about the liver. So. If you look at the liver, it's on the uh, upper right hand portion. Oh, I just chopped a whole lobe out of it. Oh, why am I doing it? You do it. I want you to cut all these things out. Why am I doing it? I'm not the surgeon. I don't like surgeons. You do it. I want to cut the liver and the, the kidney. <clears throat> Into kidneys or anything else, yeah. so just leave them. So take out the large intestine, the take out the small intestine, and take out the liver. And then we can look at it. Yeah, these are the kidneys. And yeah. Another thing I would like to Being ask shaped. is feel the consistency. How does it feel like compared yeah. to the lungs, compared there's, to there's heart, the heart, compared to other things? There's the stomach, there's the intestine. Got it. Okay. And then, as you guys can see here, Remember we talked about the peritoneum and there's still some of it in, intact. Mm -hmm. Look what's behind it, your kidneys. And if you notice the right kidney is a little bit lower than the left mm -hmm. because look how big your, uh, your liver is. Your liver is the largest metabolic. Oh, no, this no, is it. That's this not it. It'd be nice if I'm pointing at the right thing. 
Well, it's small compared to it's not small compared to um, the size of piggy. Um, I believe it's empty, so. <laughs> no, it's got some stuff in it, and that's what I'm going to show you in a minute. But yeah, it's relatively empty. It doesn't have because, of course, it's a fetal pig. They um, their um, their gastrointestinal system isn't quite uh, functional because it wasn't born yet and wasn't eating yet. So we look at the liver and everyone felt it, right? Mm -hmm. it's, pretty soft. Like soft. it's soft, it's mm -hmm. spongy. And again, it goes, if, it goes, if I brought out a brain here and it made you close your eyes, you'd be like, the brain was just a little bit softer, but then you could definitely know that, mm -hmm. that this is spongy. Now your, your liver is the largest metabolic organ in your body. And what does it do? It not only filters uh, bad things or filters toxins, Actually, that's a minor part of what it does. Everyone knows the liver is like, oh, that's the thing that's gonna filter like bad things like alcohol or whatever. Because alcohol, albeit tasty, is a poison, mm -hmm. essentially. It is not good. That's why when most people drink it, they vomit. Because when you vomit, it's your body's way of saying, hey, that doesn't belong in here. I don't like it. So if you have a patient who's drinking to the point where they're gonna vomit, that's a problem. Ugh, I did not choose the light gloves. Okay, so let me take this out and let's now show you the stomach. Ooh, I see the pancreas. Now, if you look at the pancreas, it's this long, flat, and feel the consistency of that too. It's spongy too. There you go. So that's a pancreas? Yeah, that's a pancreas. And it lies right along the greater, cur greater curvature of your stomach. And it's, it's intimately connected to the duodenum, which is the first part of your small intestine. And remember what the pancreas does. It is a glandular organ. And the two major hormones that it kicks out is uh, glucagon and um, insulin. Now, when you have insulin, when you have a big meal, and what's the function of insulin? You want the sugar not floating around in your blood, you want it where? In the inside of cells. And that's what insulin does. It's the key that opens the lock that on all the cells, boop, sugar can now go in. Now, glucagon is the exact opposite. Now, uh, I told you, when's the last time I ate? What, 5, 5.30, right? I had like, I don't know, Pop-Tart or God knows what. It was dark. I'm just moving as fast as I can because I got to get my kids to school and whatnot. So now, eh, it's not so bad because it's what, about five hours later. But let's say I keep on working until, I don't know, 5 p.m., mm. which for those of us in the medical field, that's common. Uh, there were times that I forgot to eat when I, when I used to work. Now, your glucagon will now tell your liver, hey, liver, I need gluconeogenesis. I need new, I want you to break down the fat that's in here to make sugar. So right now, I'm not in a starvation state, but eh, I might need some sugar. My pancreas is now telling, um, now sending messages via glucagon, hey, liver, I need some sugar. So it's gonna make me some sugar. Now, the bad thing is, Let's say it's past five o'clock, now it's nine o'clock and I haven't eaten yet. Now I'm definitely what? Good 12 to 14 hours since I last ate. That is putting me in a starvation state. Now, when glucagon is signaled to the liver, instead of the liver making gluconeogenesis, it makes ketogenesis. It makes ketones. Now ketones are a good substitute for uh, glucose for a while, for a short time. But if it goes on, let's say I'm on a starvation diet because I want to fit into a size two for my sister's wedding or something like that, something <laughs> stupid like that. You guys laugh, but how many times I have these young people in my ER, they're dehydrated and haven't eaten for days just because they can fit into what are stupid dress or stupid thing that they have for whatever stupid event, right? And they get really sick. Now, what's the problem? Ketones are neurotoxic. 
they will affect your brain. And we all know this. What happens when I, when I don't eat? Don't you get funny? Mm -hmm. Like maybe giggly or hyper irritable, or you can't, uh, you can't do two plus two and things like that. Like, and um, I always tell the story uh, um, about how, just know that at one time when I was young, I didn't eat for four days. It's because uh, we were in a, a specific situation where uh, we couldn't get back home. We were out walking around the woods for like four days. We're on the third day, how do you think how weird everybody got? Everyone got really weird. We were starting laughing, crying, because why? The ketones are now flooding my brain and it's now very hard to think, right? And walking home was very hard. And to this day, I don't remember half of it. All I remember was that um, oh, they, they get me in an IV and <laughs> uh, they said I was okay after a couple of days. Yes, question. So for people that do fast for 12 hours, like a month because of religious. Yeah, but that's okay. Because by the 12th hour, what do you guys do? Then you eat, you eat. Okay. all right? And, uh, but I'm talking about greater than 14 hours okay. or people who are on starvation diets where I only eat a cookie or mm -hmm. something stupid. Okay. Like, oh, every six hours, I had a friend of mine, and she ended up in the ER because every six hours she goes, I'm on this black bean diet. I get to eat a bowl of black beans like every 12 hours. And I told her, Stacy, please don't do that. Two weeks later, right? She calls me from Columbia Presbyterian and like, can you come down here and pick me up? And I'm like, why? I'm in the hospital for dehydration. I'm like, Jesus. And then guess what happened to her uh, kidneys? Her kidneys got bashed around because she wasn't eating anything else, just beans. Mm. So that's pure protein. What's that going to do to your kidney? It's going to beat it up. She did a good diet is not is not only balanced. You have to have a little fat. You have to have a little protein. You have to have a little carbo, and it's got to be balanced and lots of water. The and the diet has to be incremental. You don't put somebody on a hardcore diet like like no salt today. That's stupid, right? They're not going to keep it. It's incremental, just like everything in life. You need to do what? Little by little by little. And then the next thing you know, you're doing what? A lot. And that's part of our job to help our patient transition from whatever horrific lifestyle that they had before into what? Little by little by little by little. Like uh, my niece, she's a little bit, she's getting bigger now because she's in college. You know, in college, you put on 20 pounds. It's like, how am I going to drop this weight? I keep on going to the gym. I tried these fat diets. And I go, how's this? What's your goal? I got to lose 15 pounds. Okay, you have one year. She goes, a year? I want to lose it like in a month. No, no that's not a year. Because if you lose it in a year, you will tend to keep it off more than a year. You lose it in a month, you will gain it all back. And plus, because your body likes what? Homeostasis. It likes being in the middle. And if you pull it from the middle, it's like a rubber band. What's going to happen? It's going to snap back and it's going to snap back with a vengeance. Like I told you guys, I quit smoking, I quit drinking. Did I do it overnight? Oh, it took me four and a half years to quit smoking. I was smoking since I was what, 14? And I quit, I was 25, 24. Oh, I didn't quit until I was almost out of medical school. I was like 28, 29. How but many what times did I did you start that? Oh yeah, <laughs> a dozen. I had the patches. Uh, my girlfriend at the time gave me a crystal to wear around my neck, which gave me a rash. It was stupid. But how's this? Little by little. This month. I'll smoke 10 cigarettes, 10 a day. That's it. This month, next month, nine, mm. next month, eight, next month, seven. What happens after it goes after uh, four, five, six months, you're down to three, right? Sometimes you skip, sometimes you fall off. And then the next thing you know, when I got it down to three or four, I started noticing whole days where I didn't have a cigarette. And I'm like, Ooh, that's weird. Because I used to have to wake up, have a cigarette. I used to have to go to sleep to have a, a cigarette. And also there were times that I had to go to sleep to have a drink. I would take a little shot of something just to calm me. That's not good. And I did that for years. But what do you do? Little by little by little by little. Same thing with your study habits. Don't think you're going to be master study. I could, I could go nine hours every day. A lot of students try to do that. It's cramming. It's no good. What do you do? Just like going to the gym, you build up your strength little by little. Well, today I'm going to practice two-hour sessions. Next week, I'm going to increase it to two and a half. The week after that, three. Next semester, I'm going to do it five. And the next thing you know, you do, you're, you're capable of doing eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 hour days. And then you get used to it, right? You got to build everything up. 
Now, let's look at the stomach because my stomach stopped growling, so. And why does your stomach growl? Why is it, what's, it, what's going on? First of all, it's a muscle. And there's a whole bunch of enzymes and there's also acid in it because it has to not only break down proteins and then uh, that requires an acidic environment, but it also, think of all the food you eat. Go on YouTube and research like um, how to properly clean your vegetables. Like for example, if you guys ever had strawberries, right? And you just rinse it, right? And then you eat it. Well, a couple of years ago, I had this trick. You put it in brine, a little bit of salt and water and you leave it in there. A whole of these bunch of worms are gonna start coming out of the pores of, of your strawberries because they naturally live there, right? And I'm like, at first I'm like, oh, that's just YouTube messing with me. But when my daughter goes, look, mama, look, look, worms. I'm like, oh my God, now I, I didn't, I don't think I ate strawberries for a month. Now, what am I saying? Everything that you eat, no matter how much you microwave it, no matter how much you cook it, has things in it, has bacteria in it. Oh, by the way, your mouth, you could gargle with uh, Listerine and gasoline. There'll still be a lot of nasty things in there, right? Don't you think that stuff gets into the stomach? Don't you think that stuff can get me sick? That's why I don't care if a dog bit you. But if another human bit you, I have a, I have, I start having concerns. I start doing a swab on the wound. I start doing a whole bunch of things because if a dog bit you, I look at it, I clean it. If they, if the dog has not suspicious for rabies, I'm like, I move on with my day. But if I've heard that you've been in a fight or uh, uh, you've been in an altercation where someone's mouth broke your skin for whatever reason, I give you broad spectrum antibiotics. I have to now look at the wound, swab the wound, and in five, six days, I have to do a culture and sensitivity on that wound, right? Because why? There's a lot of dirty things and the acid in your stomach now will do what? Neutralize it. Now, we already mentioned that pH two is pretty vicious. It, it can melt um, the metal on your car. So why doesn't it melt this? Protection layer. Yep. So I'm opening it. Feel around in there. What do you feel? And it should feel familiar. Yeah, it's like a smooth mucosa. Yeah, it's mucus. Mucose. There's a ton of it. This is huge mucosal layer. Now, what happens if I drink, eat too much salt, drink too much alcohol, or have a very high stress life where my uh, where my acid gets even what more acidic? then it's going to bore a hole in this thing and then you have an ulcer, mm. right? An ulcer is just a fancy word for hole, okay? That's all it is, it's just a hole, but you shouldn't have a hole in your stomach and you need that. Now, if you look at your intestines, you could see there's large ones like this and the large ones, they kind of look like feces, like poops. And there's a reason because it forms this stuff called haustra, these little pockets. And that's why, you know, feces, or poops look like poops. And you have the small intestines. And if you look in between the small intestines, yeah. those are the arteries and veins. That's the reason why last Thanksgiving, when you were, whatever you had, that's why you got sleepy. Because imagine you have a very fat laden meal and it was delicious. Don't you think it's going to require a lot more processing? And in your small intestines, the function is to absorb nutrients. And in your large intestine, its function is, it looks like poops, doesn't it? Is to of course make feces. And its primary function isn't the feces. The feces is the waste, it's like the after effects. But the primary function of your large intestine is water absorption. So if you had a bad street taco, what happens? The water doesn't stay inside you. It's all fatty and greasy. What's gonna happen? You get diarrhea, all the water, all the nutrients will go where? in the toilet. And that's why diarrhea, right, to a lay person doesn't mean like much. It, means, it feels like an inconvenience. But to us, medical personnel, diarrhea is very dangerous. How many babies that, how many babies I had to write a death protocol because of diarrhea? How many patients greater than 65 years of age go south on me really fast because of diarrhea? Because think of the word diarrhea. Rhea means what? Flow, excessive flow, dia, complete or thorough. That means everything that's supposed to be absorbed by my intestine is now in the toilet. Mm. So that's why when you have colitis or enterocolitis or um, 
uh, uh, you, you know when uh, they have all those commercials for um, 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 what do you call it? Um, uh, irritable bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome. It seems benign, but IBS and IBD is very, very dangerous because you think if I can't absorb the stuff that I'm eating, that means I'm not eating. Okay. Or how can I eat when all the time my stomach hurts or this, oh, the cramping for IBD and IBS. That's why when I was a resident, that was one of my things that I, I wanted to go into. If I stayed, I wanted to go into um, gastrointestinal because I see how many people suffer by it. So with that being said, I think we went through all the systems, okay? Uh, and I don't, I'm not going over the kidney because uh, in anatomy and physiology too, you actually open up an, a, a big cow kidney that's like this big, mm. right? So uh, I'll reserve it for that. But when you look at it, what we did today is you looked at it from top to bottom and it's a process and you can see how just because we talk about one week, we talk about this, next week we talk about that. You have to now start thinking, all of it's related. All of it is linked up. And if one part doesn't work and the other part uh, works, guess what? The part that's working won't work for long because all of this has to be together. And that's why pathology is really important to us. And I know it's a misnomer, patho means disease, but in my head, patho means path. Pathway to what? Destruction, to death. And my job is to do what? Stop it. Cut it off at the pass, right? And then do what? Try to back it up a little bit. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the great things I'm telling you, number one is lifestyle changes. Like uh, it was on, not until like I seriously stopped smoking, stopped drinking, trying not to eat garbage and going back to the gym and, go, and, and, and trying to do things. My sleep is better. Everything's better. And um, here's also the other great thing about exercise. And I'm always going to promote it. 25 million Americans right now are on antidepressant medications. Let that sink in for a minute. 25 million people are so sad that they have to take meds. Well, the one thing that's really neat about working out or doing something you like that's like, you know, strenuous, like dancing, or maybe you, like my mother, she likes gardening. She hates the gym, but she loves gardening. She's out there right now in the cold, digging up something or planting something, is that, first of all, you feel accomplishment, right? And it takes your mind off of the, you know, as an adult, isn't it hard being an adult? There's a million and two horrible things that go through your head. Like, what if I can't pay this? What if I can't pay my rent? What if I get in a car accident? What if I get sick? What if my family gets sick? Isn't it very easy to let all of this stuff seep in your head, right? Or what if I don't make it? That was a big thing when I was in training. Like I'm spending all this money and time and a lot of people around me are failing left and right. What if I don't make it, right? How's this? Just do, when you're, when, when you're working out, you, it, your mind starts wandering and it's weird because scientifically your body amongst that pain of working out starts releasing hormones and endorphins to make you feel better. And uh, how many times I've had a bad workout? Last night was one of them. I had a bad workout because I was like, oh, I can't lift what I want to lift. I can't run what I can run. But you know what? On the drive home, I felt what? Kind of calm because there's no such thing as a bad workout. Or let's say you love studying and then you spend your time studying. Ever have a good study session? And after you're done, you're like, I know stuff. Ooh, I, I know way more than I did a minute ago. And then what does that do for your ego? Makes it good. Oh, I feel smart. I'm, I'm smart. Oh, I'm, I, am, I am smart and I will make it. And do you see how that will do? Instead of what? Popping pills all day. Right? I got a lot of friends. They pop pills all day. Oh, why am I all sad? And I'm like, I don't know. You're focusing on pills all day. He goes, why don't you do some work? Why don't you get up? I started getting up early. Um, it was years ago. Uh, uh, I saw um, there's this guy. Uh, um, there's this guy, Jocko. He's a Navy SEAL. And uh, he wrote one of those inspiration books and um, I gave it to my son, but I didn't read it. Well, my son left it while he was on deployment and he read it and I read it. And one of the things that, that uh, he, had, he had depression, just like everybody else, he had PTSD, just like everybody else, because you know, someone who's a soldier who does really crazy things, that stuff stays with you for a long time. But what he was saying is, hey, I wake up five o'clock in the morning, no matter what. I'm like, well, that's insane. I wanna, I wanna sleep. Right? But waking up at five when everything's calm and quiet, 
and you get work done. Like I did all my registrations this morning. I got here like seven o'clock and I did all my registrations so that now am I nervous? Am I worried about the rest of the day? No, I'm actually ahead of the game. Now I could take my time and I don't worry. And also the other thing is worry about or do only focus on one thing at a time. Like I, I hope those of you at home are focusing on what? This. I know it's hard when, when you're at home, right? There's kids and distractions, uh, but when you're only focused on one thing at a time, are you focused on the horrific stuff on the outside world? No, you're only focused on what? This, that's it. So when you study, so right now, you guys heard my phone, right? Buzz, 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 buzz. I don't care. The only thing I care about is what? This. And when this is all done, I'll deal with the other stuff in due time. Right? That's another problem that many of us have, especially those of us who are in the healthcare game. You try to do so much all at once, right? Focus on one thing at a time. Because if you do multitasking and I'm focusing on this patient, this patient, this patient, this patient, guess what happens? The meds for this patient will go to this patient. The management for this patient will go to that patient. And what happens to your career? You get to go to court. And they wonder, why did I hire you? And it's not because you're stupid, it's because why? You're trying to take on too much. And it's the same thing with personal life. Or, or, or all those things. Everything's all balanced. But when you're in the ward, that was also one of my main problems. When I was in the ward, I used to worry about my kids. And when I was home, I used to worry about my patients. So it caused a lot of problems at home uh, to the point uh, my wife left me for a year when I was in residency. Why? Because she said, you have to focus on your job because they will kick you out of there if you can't get it together. Because during my third year residency, I was having a really hard time. I was thinking, I, maybe I need meds. Maybe No, I need to focus on one, right? And she just took the kids and went, oh, I don't, and I'm like, what the hell? But she said, no, we're not leaving you. We're just leaving you to do the job. After that, they came back. It was great. It was fun. And here's also the other dividends, and then I will call it a day. What happens to your kids when they see you managing your lifestyle and your work? They tend to copy you. I never told Chanel, hey, be a doctor. I never told uh, my younger one, be a doctor. But now what do they want to do? They want to be doctors. And I'm like, okay, now I got to go rob a bank, uh, learn how to rob some banks or uh, maybe get into this cryptocurrency, who knows? But because all my kids now emulate me or at least to emulate the good stuff. They didn't emulate the bad stuff, which is kind of weird. None of my kids drink. Or they like, I even tried like when Chanel was 20, I'm like, hey, Shan, you know how to smoke weed? Come on, let's go smoke weed, <laughs> right? It's legal now, right? Let's go. And she was like, why would I want to do that? And I go, because it's dope. Come on, let's go smoke, smoke some weed. It's good. So let's chill you out, right? Because she's very stressed about her nursing lifestyle, right? And then he goes, come on, let's have a couple of drinks. Same thing with my Duke, right? He's a military guy. He's exposed to a lot of drinking, a lot of smoking. And I go, um, after his first deployment. So, you learn how to do drugs now? He goes, yeah, I had a couple. And I go, and I go, you wanna, you wanna hammer some drinks with your old man? And he was like, nah, I'll just get a soda. Uh, <laughs> not crazy? After two tours in Afghanistan and all he learned how to do was drink cherry Coke? That's crazy. So I got how many people? One, two, three, four, plus me. And I got you guys. Um, I will put this recording up if you wanna look at it again, but there'll be also another recording for uh man i need a haircut um there will also be another recording for the actual lecture for this week so again everyone thank you thank you for uh stopping by and um for those of you guys who are here i believe you guys were already here for the last lab so you don't have to come to next week but those of you if um for next week it goes if uh you guys want to come to uh come to lab but i think next week we should just have a normal lecture and then prepare for our final because next week is nine. Anyone have any questions? No, thank you. Comments?